Hi, Ms. Grundy. The paper I'm going to be talking about today is called A Deep Learning Approach to Antibiotic Discovery, and it was written by researchers from the Weiss Institute at Harvard, as well as MIT's faculty at CS, and it was published in Cell last year in 2020. First off, I want to give a brief overview into the field of deep learning framework discovery, and I think there are four major areas in which this application has really emerged. The, the first being property prediction, in which you're given a molecule and you want to predict bioactivity or some desired property. The second being reaction prediction, which similar to our organic reactions unit, you have, say, two reactants and you want to predict the products as well as the type of reaction. And so these two are incredibly doable today and have a, whole, um, a bunch of different existing literature which has been able to do this uh, quite effectively. The other two areas which are sort of more emerging are trying to figure out ways for modeling both chemical and biological properties, as well as lead optimization for drug discovery, in which you have an existing molecule and you want to optimize its structure for a specific property. And so I was especially interested in the molecular property prediction area because I wrote a paper that looked at using language-based or models which directly learned on string or text-based representations of molecules for predicting biochemical toxicity in small molecule drugs. So this paper definitely came up on my radar and my interest when I first uh, heard about it. And so the motivation of this paper is essentially trying to solve antibiotic resistance because the, by 2050 there will be an estimated 10 million in deaths per year due to resistant infections uh, and resistant strains of bacteria that essentially don't have antibiotics that, are, that, that currently work today. And that's because since the discovery of penicillin, antibiotics have really been a cornerstone in modern medicine, but these new uh, and res uh, strains that are really resistant to existing antibiotics have emerged and sort of become a huge issue for, I think, all of civilization. And so I think this paper came was really interesting because they were actually able to design a small molecule and discover a small molecule drug or antibiotic that was able to inhibit the growth of one very serious pathogen called Acinobacter, Acinobacter balmani, which was actually classified by the World Health Organization as being an incredibly dangerous pathogen which needs a new antibiotic. And the way they're able to do so is really by using computational modeling. And so they use these predictive models which allow us to screen a much vaster chunk of chemical space over a hundred million molecules that we can't actually experimentally validate because that would be too time consuming and far too expensive and they're able to screen those and make and use uh, computational predictions instead to sort of lower or filter out the molecules that are less likely to work out experimentally anyways. And so it's a three-step process that they sort of employ to do this. The first being taking a deep neural network model which is trained to, big, to predict growth inhibition of E. coli the second step being using this trained model and then running it on a library of over 107 million molecules from the Zinc-15 data set. And then they use this to essentially have a list of high ranking compounds, 99 of which are from the broad repurposing hub. And so they experimentally look at these, which are all high scoring molecules. And so they experimentally test these in vitro on E. coli and identified 51 of them, which were actually incredibly promising hits for inhibiting, cell, uh, inhibiting growth of E. coli. So to really go through the different empirical data and how they generated it, it's essentially 2,560 molecules from two sets, 2,335 of which were actually unique. 1,760 of these molecules came from different structural and functional molecules, which came from a widely available US FDA approved drug library. The other 800 or so came from natural products isolated from different plant, microbial, and animal sources. And so any any uh, molecule that, that successfully inhibited more than 80% of growth was considered a hit. And so we had 120 positive labeled molecules for the machine learning model to train on. And so when we talk about training, essentially what the model is doing really briefly is it's essentially taking a look at this labeled data of which molecules are able to effectively inhibit growth and which aren't. And it's trying to make predictions off of this existing data distribution. And the way it's doing that is it's by representing molecules as graphs to learn about their structure. So the reason why representing molecules as graphs is a really, really interesting, is, is a really strong analogy in my opinion, is because you can think of every node in a graph as an atom and every edge as a bond. And the, edge are, the edges are really what c connect the, different, the two different neighboring nodes. So that, that's a really good analogy or model for uh, organic, rea or organic structure because you have the same situation in which a node can be an atom and an edge can be a bond.
And so building off of this, you can essentially form this continuous vector or convert this graph into a series of numbers from which the machine learning model can learn the structure and then make a prediction. But what chemical details are actually encoded behind, beyond just the ad, what atom or what bond type it is? There are actually a lot of different encoded details, which actually have a really strong correlation to many of the different things we learned about in our grade 12 units. You, you, in, the, in the atom level features, which atom level features, which form the vector, you can learn things like the atom type, the number of bonds, the formal charge, things like the aromaticity, the hybridization, and all of these are essentially converted to number. So the atom type is converted to the atomic number. The hybridization can either be one of five different possible numbers, and all of these are sort of embedded into this continuous vector. But then for the bond level vectors, it's essentially looking at things like the bond type, whether it's a single bond, a double bond, a triple bond, or an aromatic bond, or things like whether it's a stereoisomer or a cis transmitting. So many different chemical details that you would learn in a grade 12 class are actually embedded to help the model make this prediction. So looking at ChemProp specifically and its architecture, it's essentially a direct message passing neural network that will predict the likelihood of a given molecule to inhibit growth of a specific bacteria. And so for this purpose, the way like a direct message passing network works is it uses a direct bond to bond based message passing approach. So it, what it does is it iteratively aggregates the features of every single individual atom and bond. So when you look at what a single atom's vector will be, it's not only the atomic structure for that atom, but it's also the atomic structure for neighboring atoms. So for example, looking at atom two, you can learn about, it. it's also embedding the details of atom three, atom one, and atom four. And so all of these are, are actually averaged and essentially form the, the general atomic structure and the general atomic vector for atom two. And this is done for every single atom. So you can think of it as basically going and traveling around this molecule and creating these vector representations and passing messages between atom to atom by traveling across each of the bonds. And so by doing this, you sort of accumulate these higher order or higher level messages that they like to use. And so these, the highest level bond messages are essentially all averaged into a single continuous vector, which is a series of numbers. And that is supposed to be a representation of the entire molecule. There are some limitations of this approach. The major one being that when you average all of this data from all the structural details of each atom or each bond, you lose a lot of vital information because it's really just an average of all of the information. And at the same time, you also can run into information bottlenecks in the network where the, mo the model is not able to understand or essentially generalize to all of the complex atomic structural detail or bond structural detail that's being encoded in this approach. However, it does work for a really intuitive and really elegant solution for teaching computers to learn chemistry, really. And so using this approach, they're able to identify a, an N-terminal kinase inhibitor, which they renamed halicin, as a potential inhibitor for E. coli growth. It's really interesting because it's actually very structurally divergent from conventional an antibiotics and because it previously was used in a preclinical trial phase for a diabetic diabetic treatment, but it failed the preclinical phase. So it's kind of seeing its redemption moment and being seen as a promising antibiotic. And so halicin structure is it's basically a nitrothiazole, which means it's this heterocyclic compound that contains both sulfur and nitrogen. And as you look at the structure, you can actually see that there are also these these nitro and amine groups and so it contains a lot of interesting functional groups as well and so this this is actually what allows it to really display really strong growth inhib inhibitor inhibitory activity against E. coli and in addition to being a really strong inhibitor of E. coli it also performs quite well on another pathogen which I mentioned before which is the the, the A. baumani uh, in pathogen so essentially, the, the, the really the strongest result that you can take from this is that when they applied this to mice models, which contain the, this Baumani pathogen, they actually found that in a control group that had six mice that did not respond well to another antibiotic called ampicillin, five out of six of those mice actually responded well to the, to the, to the halicin treatment. And after about, I think, six doses over a 24-hour, over a 144-hour period, they actually, uh, the, the amount of, I think, this pathogen, this Baumani pathogen left in their system was actually below the limit of detection. So this was a really, really strong result, and I think why they were able to publish in Nature. 
So I, 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 so that's sort of a major summary of the entire paper. And uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think what really highlights this, the significant impact of this sort of paper is really the impact machine learning can have on early stage antibiotic drug discovery efforts. Because you're not only able to increase the accuracy rate of lead compound identification, but you're also able to reduce the cost of experimental screening efforts by limiting the number that actually need to be experimentally screened like they do in this paper. Um, I hope you enjoyed listening to this and feel free to uh, email me with any questions or feedback. Thanks.